Center, a new video by Derek Marshall from Twilight Productions. Derek Marshall is a studio potter in Sandwich, New Hampshire. He and his wife Linda opened their Sandwich Kiln studio in 1971. He has been a juried member of the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen since 1971, making and selling wheel and hand formed pottery of all types to a wide variety of clientele, from private collectors and museums to international hotels around the world. His study of ceramic art began in Japan in 1966 as an apprentice to Matajiro Kawamura in Kamakura near Tokyo. In 1968, he studied with Richard Lafayette at the Norfolk Museum Art School in Virginia. In 1970, he entered art school at the Kyoto City University of Fine Art, Kyoto, Japan. While studying in Kyoto, he also worked with other potters around Japan, learning a variety of specialized techniques. He has centered and thrown hundreds of tons of clay in his career. Derek's work has been exhibited in the White House and the Smithsonian, among other places. He has held several one-man exhibitions in Japan, taught pottery for the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, and at San Diego State University. He has acted as a consultant to the National Endowment for the Arts and has received awards from the New York City Resource Council and the Illuminating Engineering Society of America Award for Best Lighting Design and the Design Journal ADEX Award for Design. He is currently on the Artist Advisory Board to the New Hampshire State Council for the Arts and Chairman of the Sandwich Home Industries affiliated with the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. Hello, I'm Derek Marshall. This is my studio. Thanks for stopping by. I've been making pots here for 25 years. That's a lot of clay. Today we're going to talk about the very basics of throwing in the potter's wheel, and that's centering clay, something that everybody seems to have trouble with initially. It's not a difficult process if you know the physics involved. That's what we're going to talk about today, the actual physics of centering clay. If you understand that, you won't have any problem with it. It will be something that will become automatic. It won't, won't ever be a problem for you later on. You will simply go from there to making pots, and centering clay will become just as automatic as breathing. So why don't you settle back, watch this tape. We'll start out wedging some clay and get into this process. OK, let's start out with about 10 pounds of clay. That's an easy amount to center. It's enough to make a bunch of pots out of it. Now what I'm going to show you here is basically straightforward Japanese technique. I learned this in Japan, lived there for several years, and it's good technique. The Japanese have been making pots for a long time, and they have it really figured out. Wedging clay. What you're doing here is homogenizing the clay, getting it so there are no soft spots or hard spots. What I'm doing here is coming down on the clay, splitting it in half, and bringing it up and rolling it back together. I'm smearing it together. Bring in the wings, roll it down, smear it together. This is a very quick blending method and a very important thing to do. If you try throwing clay that has hard spots, soft spots in it, it's not going to work. It's absolutely essential to have very homogeneous clay. When you've done this enough and your clay feels like it's pretty homogeneous. The next step is to get the bubbles out of it, the de-airing technique. Let me step around this side. Perhaps. This may look a little complicated, and it takes a little time to learn it, but it works. It's very quick. It's very efficient. And I'll just do it a little bit here, and then I'll explain what I'm doing so you can better understand it. This is what they call chrysanthemum wedging in Japan because it looks like a chrysanthemum, though I really don't see that. This is what you're doing here. You're taking the clay again, you're splitting it right down here, and you're wrapping it up. You're wrapping up the top part here, the bottom part is wrapping up here. Where they come together, there's a lot of pressure, the air bubbles are popped out. We're not talking about necessarily big air bubbles. Some of the air bubbles are microscopic, and they can be just as devastating to the clay because they stop the clay from sticking together. Clay is a very strange mineral. It is, after all, just decomposed rock. So here's the clay at this part is pivoting in the hand. The left hand is going back and forth in a clockwise direction, sort of elliptically shaped. This hand here, you're putting pressure with your right hand, and splitting the clay right there. See the split? This part comes out here, this part goes down here. 
You go round and round, and the clay just winds around and around. There's no substitute for just trying this on your own. This, I've shown you what to do. Sometimes the clay will start to walk around on you. Well, that's just a question of what kind of motion you're making here. You're going straight down in the clay. Your upper body shouldn't be doing any of the work. The work should be done with your legs. I'm wedging clay with my legs. How's that? The table is low. I can, when I stand up, my fingertips just bend on the tabletop. So that when I come down on the clay, I come down with a straight arm and shoulder. I fall on the clay and catch myself on my leg. My leg brings my body up. I'm just using my body weight. My legs bring the body weight up. So basically, I'm not using much muscle. I'm using the strongest muscles in my body, that's my legs. Obviously, there's some shoulder work involved here, but it should not be all upper body work. How many times do you do this? Potters in Japan will tell you 200 times. But that's usually because they have apprentices doing it for them. But 100 times is not a bad idea. It doesn't take that long. It takes less than a second for each stroke. So you can easily go through 100 times in a minute or two. To finish it up, just diminish the pressure. Let it roll up into your hand, into a cone. There you have it. There's the closing seam. The closing seam is a weak part of the clay. You want to put that on the bottom of the wheel. How do you do that? Put that part in your hand, tip the cone on its nose, and now start rolling it this way. The reason you do this is to prevent the pots from splitting in the bottom when they dry. S cracks in the bottom of pots, fairly common. It's caused by various problems, and you must use various techniques to prevent that from happening. This is the first one, that's to turn the clay 90 degrees. There's that seam. Did I say it goes on the bottom? It goes on the top. The closing seam goes on the top because that is the clay that's going to have the most compression when you throw it. The bottom piece is going to have the least compression when you throw it, so you want the best clay down there. I'll explain what those terms mean about compression and so on when I get to the wheel. Any questions? Let's take it to the wheel. Consider the potter's wheel. This is a very precise piece of machinery. Whether it's a kick wheel, a hand wheel, or an electric wheel, basically, it'll have a pretty decent set of bearings. These bearings are much more precise than your hands can ever understand. If you try to center clay on the wheel by somehow forcing the clay to conform to the center of that wheel, it's never going to work. Look at that precision you've got there. You somehow have got to conform yourself to that precision, but there's no way, humanly, that your body is capable of doing it. All right, let's consider the wheel again. A couple of things. If we draw a line down the middle, and a line across this way, we'll cut it into four quadrants. Now, although the wheel's turning, imagine these quadrants are stationary. Because we are Westerners, we're going to be throwing in a counterclockwise wheel. Frequently in Japan, they'll throw on a clockwise wheel. It doesn't make any difference. It's just that you'll be working on one side of the wheel or the other. In a counterclockwise wheel, you will always be working in the lower right-hand quadrant. If you remember that, you'll never get into trouble. Almost never do your hands get into these three quadrants. This is off territory. This is where you work, lower right quadrant. Position on the wheel, I like to be up high. The seat is about the same level as the wheel head. And these are probably preferences because I studied in Japan. This gives you the advantage, though, of being able to lean your body on your arms, take your body weight off your back, potter's back, terrible thing. You should not be using your back muscles when you're working on the wheel. Use your elbows to your advantage. Keep them on your knees. Get your body weight right over the clay. You can get your head right over the wheel, that's a good position to be. Okay, clay on the wheel, here's our 10 pounds of clay. Tools, boy, you don't need many tools for making pots. In the beginning, a sponge, a cutoff tool, and a needle tool. This is the tool of failure. If you are really, really good, you'll never use this tool. I haven't got to the point where I don't need it, but every time I use it, it's because I've done something wrong. I don't have any splash guards around the wheel, too, and that's 
something that I don't like. Splash guards, big buckets all around it get in your way. They're a nuisance. But worse than that, they're teaching you bad habits. They're teaching you that you can be really sloppy on the clay, and it doesn't matter because we've got all kinds of stuff here to collect the sludge that won't get on you. The thing is, you should not be creating sludge when you're working on the wheel. If you are, you are hurting the clay, you're weakening it, and you're making it less able to become what you want it to become. Remember, clay has no ambition at all. It doesn't care what it is. If it's going to become something nice. It's only because it's in your brain. Wheel should be damp. Throw the clay on. Is that where the term throwing comes from? Some people say it is. I don't know. There it is. Send it. Not at all. But get it sent by eye as closely as you can. Slap it down. Slap it as the wheel goes around. Not powering the wheel, it's just going around its own. Okay, that's close. That's about as close as I need to worry about getting it. From now on, the wheel is going to do the centering. This wheel has a nice little electric motor. If you're using a kick wheel, you've got a big flywheel. Use the power in that flywheel or in that electric motor to center the clay. You're not going to center the clay. The wheel is going to center the clay. You're simply going to use your hands to apply pressures, which will cause the clay to center itself. Sounds simple? It is simple. A little sponge, a little water. It's ready to start putting a little pressure on the clay. Now, this axle on this clay is a very precise piece of gear. You're going to have to make the clay center on that axle, but since you don't know where it is, imagine if the axle were visible, if it were extended, it would be a rod sticking right up through the air here, and the clay is going to have to center on that rod. Okay, the technique here is to apply an off-centering motion to the clay. And I'm going to off-center the clay to my left side, upper left side, using this part of my hand. My left hand, I'm just going to press down on it, my elbow inside my thigh for pressure, and using a little water to keep it lubricated, push the clay off center to the left. Now this, I'll take this one step at a time because I would also be using the other hand too, but to keep things simple, the slip here is useful to keep lubricating the clay. Off center it, as you see, it's going pushed off center and to the left. As the clay goes down, it gets lower and fatter. I've got to bring the clay up again with the right hand and enough lubrication. Make an undercut here so that you can start bringing the clay up from this rise in the clay. A high point right here, you want to make that flow up. Catch that again on this part of your hand. A little finger side down across here. Got some hard bones here. Basically, you're going to be touching the clay whenever you touch it with the hardest parts of your hands. These are the bones across here, your fingertips. Never touch the clay in here. You don't want to touch the clay in here. You will probably have to touch the clay here, but don't apply pressure in this part. It, it takes a lot of friction. It will tear the clay. You want to use these hard parts of your clay, the bony parts of your hand. So with the right hand now, come in on this ridge right here. Catch it on the bony part of your left hand and pull it in to your left hand and bring it up, pulling it towards you. And again, I'm offsetting it a little bit to the left. Now, how can I prove that? I'll show you. I'll bring it up, and if I let go quickly, you can see that the clay was that far off center, which brings us to the only two rules of clay that I know. The first rule is, whenever you touch the clay, you're going to take it off center relative to the wheel head. Whenever you touch clay, you're going to do that. If you're not doing that, you're not going to be moving the clay, and you're just wasting your time and weakening the clay. The second rule of clay is, whenever you release the clay, you release gently back to the wheel. The wheel will take the clay and center it. First rule of clay, always take it off center when you touch it. Second rule of clay, release slowly back to the wheel whenever you let go. Demonstration of that. Off center the clay, going down. Release slowly, it goes back. The opposite, bringing the clay up, pull it towards me, off-centering it, 
release slowly. The clay is centering. I'm not having anything to do with making that clay go on center. I'm simply providing a force that lets the clay do it on its own. Let me just demonstrate that a little more forcibly here. Here's clay off center. This is wildly off center. If you're doing this with the clay, you're in trouble. And you see that all the time when people try to learn how to center clay. You can't catch the clay and push it on the center. What you are doing is catching the clay and taking the clay to your center. My center is the center of my hands. For instance, see that clay? Centering on my hands right there. Let me run that through again. There's the clay, off center, centered on my hands. Release, the clay goes back to the wheel center. So the clay is constantly going between my center and the wheel center. Whenever you touch the clay, the clay must be on your center, which is what I call off-centering the clay. Off-center relative to the wheel center, on-center relative to your center. Sounds confusing? It's not really. It's just that you have to practice it, and you'll try it, and you'll see for yourself. Here's the clay going off-center. Can you see how much is off-center there? Here's the clay going down again, just catching the clay right here. All I'm doing is providing an off-centering force. And then the clay, I'm releasing slowly, and it's centered. I'm not making the clay go on center by any means. I'm making the clay go firmly off-center, but it's a very controlled off-center. My center is a controlled off-center. This is an uncontrolled off-center, and this is trouble. You cannot do anything with clay like that. And if you don't have the clay centered perfectly, you'll never be able to make a perfect pot. Sometimes you can make nice pots out of uncentered clay, and that kind of feeling can be delightful. But only if you choose it to be that way. I suggest you learn how to center clay very precisely. Then you can choose to be as loose about it as you want to be later on. Let me just take that through one more time. Starting with the, with the rectangular theory, you've got four quadrants. I'm off-centering the clay in the initial steps to my left, into the upper left quadrant. Using pressure, straight arm, body weight leaning down on the clay, going into this tuck position at the bottom, which is very powerful. I can put a lot of pressure on that clay with one hand. I can break it right off right here and putting my whole body weight into it. See how I've taken it in here? That's too much. It will break off. Whenever you see this happening, you see the high points here that stick up? Get on the high points and control them. Here's a high point. Control that. Again, I'm just taking off starting to the left, and the clay comes down. When I'm on top of the clay, I've got my pressure point right in the middle. As I come down, the pressure slips down my hand. On top of the clay, slipping down, dropping into the tuck position, finishing off right at the base of the clay with the pressure right down in here. You notice I haven't even used my right hand for that operation. Most throwing on a clockwise, on a counterclockwise wheel is done with the left hand. Seems strange, but it really is neither left-handed nor right-handed. But the left hand is the predominant hand. And since you haven't, if you haven't learned to do this already, it's just as easy to learn to do it with your left hand as your right hand. If you want to do it with your right hand, throw on a clockwise wheel. This wheel goes in either direction, but you don't have that option most times. Okay, very quickly again, clay is up. I'm going to touch the clay. I'm going to take it off center that far, and that will take the clay down. I'm coming off the clay, back to the base, and a slow release. That's centered clay. You don't need to be any more accurately centered than that. That is just fine. Bring it up, both hands off center to the left, down to the left. This process is called wedging on the wheel head. It's a good thing to do to the clay before you start to throw. Since I'm doing Japanese technique here, I intend to make several small bowls off this one lump of clay. Ten one-pound bowls, perhaps. Two five-pound bowls, and so on. Having centered the clay, bring it up to a nice cone shape. 
Again, don't forget that slow release. Here I am bringing it up. It's off-centered that much. You see how much off-centered it is? I have control over that clay. It's off-centered in my hands. And then release slowly, bringing your hands away and down. Now, I'm doing this too long. I'm doing too much of it. If you do too much of this, you're just going to weaken the clay. I'm also making too much of a mess around here because I'm, I'm doing too much wedging in the wheel head. Three or four times up and down is all you need. This is the, what the clay should look like when you're getting ready to throw. Clean off some of the slip. Now again, we're looking at the four quadrants of the wheel. All my throwing, all my working, that's now going to be done in the lower right-hand quadrant. The most difficult thing after centering is the opening of this clay. It's the turning of this clay into a hollow form. If your opening isn't done accurately, and if it's not done with precision, one side of the bowl is going to be thicker than the other side of the bowl. That is going to wind up as uneven wall thickness and or uneven rims. The rims will be wobbly. Now, you may choose to make wobbly parts, and that's fine, but don't do it simply because you cannot open the clay properly. Let's talk about how we're going to open the clay now. This is done with a pretty fast wheel. Centering on the wheel is done with the fastest wheel. The second fastest speed is the opening of the clay. The actual throwing, the wheel will slow down even more. With an electric wheel, it's very easily accomplished with, with just the pressure of your foot. With a kick wheel, it naturally slows down as you go along anyway. Opening is done by grabbing the clay and pulling it towards you that much. On center to my hands, off center to the wheel. First rule of clay. I'm going to have my hands wrapped around the clay. This is in violation of the rules where I say you don't wrap your hands around the clay, but you do at this point just for steadiness. I'm going to open the clay with my left thumb. The right thumb is going to be on top, heels of the hands together. This is a very braced position and your elbows are tucked into your body. This is really important. This is a very controlled and powerful position. I'm going to push my left thumb into the clay while I've got it pulled off center towards me. At that time, the clay is going to jump onto my thumbs and center on my thumbs. I'm not going to, center the, I'm not going to open the clay on the wheel center because I don't know where that wheel center is. It's just too, too precise for the human brain to grasp. But just by grabbing the clay, Putting my thumbs in, at that amount of offset, perhaps that's a bit extreme, the clay is centered. I have equal thickness here. It looks wildly out of control because I did a quick release. Now, if I do my proper release, let the clay go back to the wheel gently, there you are. That is the embryo of any pot. Any pot you're going to make is a vessel. It's a form that has an inside and an outside that initial opening is critical. If you fail to do that correctly, you're not going to have a pot. And let me just cut this off and do it again. I'll explain this cutoff technique too later on. Okay, recenter the clay between each bowl just a little bit. It just needs a little work up and down. Bring it on up with your thumb across the top so you've got a flat top and a square shoulder. Have enough slip on the clay so it's slipping easily between your hands. Heels of your hands together, body in tight, elbows against your body, right thumb over left thumb, hands around the clay. Now I'm not going to apply too much pressure on the clay with my fingers. Just enough to hold it and pull it off center towards me as the thumbs go in. Can you close up a little bit in the shot and maybe see the thumbs going in? Now you don't have a lot of time to do this. You cannot take your time with it. It has to be done quickly. There's a great deal of friction when your thumbs go in, and that friction is going to rip the clay. So you've got to be in there and out of there fast. This is a dangerous operation. You've got one chance to do it right. What you've got to do is sit here with a lot of clay and do these openings and get rid of it, cut it off, do another one, cut it off, until you can do it quickly and precisely. Now just watch my hand position when I let go. Thumbs on top of each other, the thumbs open up like that to make the V shape of the pot. My fingers are around the clay, my right index finger comes across the top of the clay and right onto the rim. That keeps the rim thick and square. Don't let that rim get thinned out. If that rim gets thinned out in advance, 
you're going to have trouble with it because you're not going to be able to make that clay grow. The whole trick from now on is to take this thick wall of clay and to thin it and bring it up against gravity to make a bowl. The next step that has to be done is to define the foot of the bowl. Since this is a Japanese technique, it will be footed. The bowl will have a cut foot on the bottom that will be trimmed in after the clay has become leather hard. That only is not only is aesthetically pleasing, it, the pot will sit better, it won't rock, you're less likely to get S cracks in it. What you have to do is leave enough clay on here to become that foot. That will be the foot statement, and beneath that you need a place to cut the clay off. So using my index finger and middle finger, I go in here and middle finger sticks out further, so it's going to make a deeper indentation. There I have it. Here is the embryo of the pot, ready to be thrown. Here is the cutoff point. When I finish the pot, it's going to be cut off here. Here is the foot statement. This will become the foot when I trim it on there tomorrow, or however long it takes to dry. And now I'm just going to simply throw this pot. Again, the wheel is sped up a little bit, but not so fast as it was before. I'm going to use just my left hand. Left hand is all you need for making small pots like this. If it seems awkward to you, don't worry about it. When you play the violin, your left hand has to do a lot of intricate work. Or the guitar. It's perfectly capable of doing it. Don't feel that your right hand somehow has an advantage in this case. One of the problems you have with throwing clay off the mound like this is S cracks in the bottom. I showed you how to turn the clay before to put the closing seam on the top because this clay will have the most compression. One of the advantages of throwing off the mound like this is I can get my right hand right down underneath the pot. If the wheel head were right here, you're very restricted to what you can do with your hand. So for small pieces, throwing off the mound like this is very advantageous. Foot statement and cutoff point. That's so important. Don't miss that. Keep the shoulder out of your way here. You want to be able to get drop your hand down low beneath the foot statement and cutoff point. This gives you a lot of control over the clay. Middle finger coming in for the reopening. Thumb pressure on the foot statement. Middle finger comes across. Change the bite to the third finger. Third finger and thumb. Now take the bite and pull it up. Stop right here and we see there is where my fingers were. There is one point right there where the clay was thicker and that was behind my thumb and middle finger, my third finger. The clay at that point has no choice but to go up because it, as it goes through my fingers, as it's off-centered, the clay will shoot up against gravity. One more pull. Now, if you want to shape the ball at this point, you can go in there and do a shaping pull. And when I'm using my right hand here, it's just because my thumb won't reach to the bottom. That'll be another tape. We'll talk about how do you throw with two hands. If you get all of this down, you'll have 90% of everything you need to know about throwing pots. This is very quick and efficient. It's one of the most efficient hand tools in the world. You can produce pots at a prodigious rate. Fast wheel, slowing down, second pull, slower, again look at that off center, it's just a little bit, but that is what makes the clay move. You must take the clay off center when you touch it. You must release back to wheel center when you let go. Finish the rim, cut off point. What you're looking for is a nice, even set of throwing rings in there. Not fussy little tight rings, not too swoopy, just honest throwing technique. Don't let your hands go too slowly. It's a lot like playing a violin. If you have to use your conscious mind all the time to control what you're doing, that's not really playing. It has to get to the point where it's happening automatically without thinking about it. But you only get to that point by thinking about it very hard. And really slow wheel right here. And cut off even slower wheel. 
So you don't have to stop the wheel to cut it off. You can even pick it up with the wheel going. Any questions? Well, that's all there is to it. Um, we will go into more details in throwing, perhaps in a later tape. But this one is the most essential. If you understand how to do this, everything else is simple. If you can understand how to control clay, the basic rule being whenever you touch the clay, you take it off center, meaning bring it to your own center. When you release the clay, give it back to the wheel center. The clay is constantly flowing back and forth between these two centers. Clay can do that. It's interesting stuff. It's plastic. It's malleable. It doesn't mind flowing back and forth, up to a point. Whenever you're working clay on the wheel, the clay is absorbing water. It's getting weaker every time. That's why I say three pulls. That's all you've got. Don't use excess water. If you're sloshing water on the clay all the time, the clay is absorbing water and getting weaker. It's going to limit what you can do. There are limits of what you can do with clay anyway. What you want to do is to minimize those limits so you can make the best pots you possibly can. So we'll look for you next time. There are no secrets. That's all there is to it. Thanks for stopping by. Studio potter. I've been making my living as a studio potter for over 25 years right here in Sandwich, New Hampshire. Making pottery is an evolutionary process. You learn by making lots and lots of pots. To be a studio potter means you must repeat your designs. You must have the facility to be able to duplicate your good designs and that takes an acquired amount of skill. These tapes are going to show you how you can get that skill quite quickly. The technique of throwing off the mound or off the hump is strictly an Asian one. In Japan, all small container forms are thrown this way. The benefits are many. First is the time-saving aspect of wedging and centering relatively large amounts of clay. Instead of repeating wedging and centering small amounts of clay over and over again, you can center 30 or 40 pounds of clay and throw 20, 30 or 40 individual pieces without having to stop and recenter every time. This saves an incredible amount of time. Second, there are physical benefits that come from working off the mound that make it easier to get your hands around your work. This enables you to develop a rhythm in your throwing that streamlines the whole making process. When you really get the rhythm going, the pots will almost make themselves as conscious effort is no longer a requirement. Conscious effort is a requirement, however, to learn the process. There is a downside to wheel front work, perhaps, and that is, the piece must be trimmed after it's been thrown in a leather hard state, perhaps a day after you've made it. I don't consider this a downside. Most Japanese potters wouldn't either. The trimmed pot has a special feeling that the piece that's thrown off the wheel head does not have. It has a lightness and balance to it that feels very nice. A Japanese person who is examining a piece of pottery will invariably turn over the pot and look at the bottom to see what the trimming looks like right from the beginning. The appropriateness of the design of the trimming and the design of the throwing are essential features of a well-designed piece of pottery. Start out with about, I would guess this is 18 pounds of clay, right out of the pug mill. First step is to homogenize the clay. Soft spots and hard spots disappear. Second step, get rid of air pockets. Spiral wedging, How many times? Japanese potters will tell you 200 times. I tend to think 100 is the point of diminishing returns. What you're doing here is eliminating air pockets, not just the large air pockets that are in the clay, but also the microscopic ones that weaken the clay. A good pot is a pot that you throw to the absolute extreme limits of the clay. So everything you can do to keep that clay strong will mean you'll make a better pot. Close the spiral. 
There's the closing seam, it goes under your right hand. And change the axis 90 degrees. There's that closing spiral again. The reason for that is when you're throwing off the mound, you're not getting compression in the bottom of the clay. So you want your very best clay on the bottom and your weakest clay on the top. This is one of the steps that will eliminate cracking when they dry. Here are some very basic potter's tools that I use. So the needle tool, generally the tool of failure to correct mistakes, but also good for cutting off um, mugs off the mound as I showed you. So I actually prefer the ones with wooden handles because they don't sink to the bottom of a slip bucket. Probably the most useful cote is this little tiny one here that I use just for detail work. I don't do much shaping with it, I just use the sharp point of, of cleaning up curves. This is a shaping cote with the sharp edge. I do a lot of throwing of balls between anywhere from 8 inches up to you know 14 or 15 inches. This is very useful for filling out the forms. The fat rib cote is a very good cote for actually throwing clay on this. This is for really big pieces, really big bowls. I like to use this. This is a rim cote. I just use that if I want a nice rounded rim, a rounded rim with a little detail mark on it. Just pick it up and go down the rim with it. The stainless steel ribs. You can do amazing things with these. If you, some people throw with two stainless steel ribs, one inside and one out. You can make very thin, very strong pots with these. I sometimes use them for shaping, for cleaning up, if I want a really smooth surface. Plastic cote, just made out of a piece of a plastic scraper. I don't find these very useful. They're a little bit too soft and they don't have enough control. The mug cote, I use this a lot on my mugs. It defines the rim and a little rim detail and the body of the curve. It's a sharp edge cote, used for shaping, not for throwing. And it's uh, very useful just to bring the form out to the shape. And you can tip this to use it to get the underneath side. Cutoff tool. I think this is a piece of kite string, which is nice. It's nylon, doesn't rot. Knot in one end, wooden toggle in the other. And it's about eight to nine inches long. Those are your basic tools for throwing off the mound. Oh, a sponge. I don't like to use natural sponges because natural sponges, when they're covered with clay, look like pieces of clay and they usually wind up in the slip bucket, in the pug mill, and then they wind up in the middle of a really big pot that you put a lot of time and effort into. The thing about this is the piece of upholstery sponge, so you can cut them to shape when you need them. They have square edges. They don't ever look like a piece of clay, so they usually don't get recycled through your pottery, although that isn't always true. They're very cheap. When they're not good anymore, you toss them out. If you want small ones, big ones, you can get any size you want. Well, that's all I use for tools for the most part on throwing off the mound. But the best tools are the ones you make for yourself, not the ones that I made for myself. Don't copy my designs. Make up your own. I find most of the commercial tools that are available out there are not very satisfactory from my point of view. You can make these things with the most elementary hand tools. And once you've made a good one, It'll last 30 or 40 years. You can't do better than that. Tuck position. Remember the rules. When you touch clay, you take it off center. When you release, you release slowly back to the wheel center. Okay, throwing bowls off the mound. Opening the clay, right thumb over left, and a slow release. Now at this point, I have to find a mass of clay. This determines how big that bowl is going to be. If you want consistency in your throwing, you must have an awareness of what this mass of clay is between your hands. It doesn't matter what the weight is. All it means is that the next time you throw a bowl, you get that same mass of clay to throw the same size bowl. Foot statement and cutoff point. The cutoff point is narrower than the foot statement. The rest of the clay is narrow and out of the way. First pull, one hand, left thumb on the foot statement, open with your middle finger, 
pull the bite out towards your thumb, and when you get towards your thumb, the bite shifts to your third finger. You keep your fingers together, do not let them splay apart, you must have strength in your fingers by mutually supporting each other. There's the first pull. Check the push that we cut off point gently. Do it again. There's your second pull. Now at this point we're getting too big to be able to get your hand down, your thumb onto the foot statement. At this point you go to two-handed throwing. Two-handed throwing is simply an extension of one-handed throwing. Your thumb is extended by your right hand. You can extend that as far as you want. This is sort of the largest pot you can throw two-handed after that. You must separate. But any time you get your hands together, you have a lot more strength. So this time, I'm going to go in here, reopen with the middle finger. And now, instead of my thumb, my left thumb being on the foot statement, it's going to be my third finger of my right hand. The bite comes toward the outside, and now they go up together. Bite on the third finger of both hands. That's my three pulls. You want to do a shaping pull? That's fine. Just go in there and refine the shape of what you want it to be. Cut off, cut off string with a wooden handle on one end, a knot in the other. Moderately slow wheel. Let it make a line all the way around. Pull to your left, let go. It wraps, you pull it out. Picking up the pot after you've thrown it. That's what the cutoff point is for. Pick it up with your two fingers, index and middle finger, palms facing up. Don't try to pick up the ball this way. Don't apply pressure to the foot statement. The foot statement must be left perfectly intact. You lift up on this lip underneath it here. Put two fingers on each side underneath. Put your thumb on the foot statement just to control it. Give a slight twist and lift up. Carry over and put down gently on the board. You notice on the board that there is a room underneath the cutoff, underneath the foot statement, where the cutoff point is, that's narrower than the foot statement. That's very important because if that cut isn't perfectly level, at least it won't have enough strength to warp the foot because the foot statement is thicker and bigger than the cutoff point. Does that make sense? Believe me, it's important. Okay, this is a cote, it's just a piece of wood. There are various kinds of cote. This is the kind I prefer to use for small bowls. It's got a sharp side and a flat side. The holes in it are simply there to make it easy to grab because they get slippery. This is only used for shaping, it's not used for throwing. So you must throw the bowl in the same way. Allowing yourself three poles and the shaping done with the cote instead of an additional shaping pole. Again, minimal lubrication. Every time you put water on the clay, you're killing it a little bit. Push that in the cut point, redone. Cote inside, throws against the third finger of your outside hand. And the cut off. Let's do that again. You can make cotes of various sizes and dimensions, but this, to me, covers 90% of everything I need a cote for in throwing off the wheel head, off the mound, I mean. Throwing off the wheel head, I might use a bigger, fatter cote for really big pieces. But here we're concerned only with bowls up to 10 to 12 inches maximum. That's the wet size. You can use the cote to put a rim on, such as I'm doing here, or 
not as you prefer. Getting down to the bottom here, this is the last piece to be thrown out of this chunk of clay. Notice as you get lower on the wheel head, it's harder to get your hand underneath here, but still I can get my hand under here much more easily than I could if this pot were being thrown right on the wheel head. Pull number three. Shave it out a little bit. People often ask, how do you know when the bowl is finished? Seems like a simple enough question. It should be obvious, but it isn't. The bowl is finished when it's the shape you want it to be and the wall thickness is equal. The test is cut the pot in half and look at that wall thickness. What you're looking for here is an equal thickness all the way up, not including the throwing rings, that's slight irregularity. Down below here is where you're going to trim the piece tomorrow. I'm going to trim that excess out of it and you'll have a bowl that has equal thickness and therefore a nice lightness when you pick it up. Very important feeling. If you have extra thickness down here getting progressively thinner, you have the classic dog dish. This is not a nice feeling when you pick it up. Okay, throwing cups is a special technique. You know me as the Japanese call them. Mugs, whatever you want to call them, coffee mugs, teacups, are a special case. The quickest way to, and the easiest way to throw them is from a flat plate. So you do the opening the same way, but instead of leaving it as a V, you bring your thumbs all the way across. And you now have a, a flat, fairly thick plate. Throw that plate out to get equal thickness, nice strong square edge and you're ready to pull that plate up into a cup. Make sure it's well lubricated. You're going to pull it up with your right thumb in the upper right hand quadrant. Here's an exception. Your left hand is going to help bring the clay up. This is a throwing choke. You're going to choke the clay from a wide plate to a narrow cup in one go, like this. And before you let go of the clay, just throw that rim because it gets kind of wrinkly from all that effort. You now have the basic cup. Go in there and clean up the footstep and cut off point. And basically you should be able to finish this in one throw. And the shaping foam just to get it where you want it to be. Cut off just the same way as we've done before. Let's do it again. Flatten it out. Foot step and cut off point. Right thumb down, hand comes up. See where the hand is? Throw the other third. Redo the foot step and cut off point. And now it up. Let me give you the shape. You can get into a very fast rhythm with this. Speed up the wheel when you center. as you begin the shaping process. Just load a bit each time.
Now when I make cuts like this, I like to use a cote to be consistent in the form and to give it a rather specific shape. This is the cote I like to use for cups. That's the profile of the top of the cup. You've got a rim, you've got a little statement in here, and you've got the body of the cup. I'll show you how this works. Okay, should be wet. Bring this in on the rim, get the rim shape. Come down, take the bottom out, and go in there and refine it. Now I'll show you another trick for getting these things off using the needle tool, the nasty old needle tool. And if you're throwing fast, you can cut them off with one hand. I have a tendency to do this now. I mean, I change my technique as I evolve over time. But this, you just go in here with your left hand and your right hand, cut it off and pick it up. Oh, that is so easy. That's definitely not a Japanese technique. That is my technique. Little things like the rim of a cup should flare slightly at the top because it fits in the corners of the mouth. If you have a cup that's absolutely parallel sides or worse, slightly going in, you'll find they make little dribble holes on the side of your lips. So a slight flare is very important. Needle tool, your left hand just is supporting it. Needle tool comes in and the weight of it is on the needle tool when you pick it up. Okay, now we've thrown parts off the mound, which is a very productive way for making the smaller pieces, but now you want to make something bigger. Let's take a big bowl, and here we're taking bowls 10 inches and up to whatever you can handle. Those I'm going to throw off bats. Bats can be made out of a lot of things. I prefer to use just simply particle board, 12 inch diameter. I seal them with a sealer, and they last 100 years. One bat for each part you're going to throw that day. Small chunk of clay on the wheel head. This is going to stick the bats on. Just center that clay down in the center all the way to the wheel head and throw it out into a large ring. Not all the way out, but like that. Two sections is good. Bat on, tap at the center. If you don't know how to tap things to center on the wheel, it's a very handy trick to know. A single chunk of clay. Pound that onto the wheel head. Stick it down so there's no gaps at the base. And proceed to center, pretty much as you would for throwing off the mound. Except this time, there's not a lot of point in coming up really tall because we're not going to go up. We're just making one big pot. This actually is a 13-pound chunk of clay, which makes a nice bowl that will be somewhere around 13 or 14 inches in diameter when it's fired.
bring it out fairly wide because you're going to want that support for the piece. Open. I usually use my left thumb and my right hand on top. Going down, far enough. There's the initial opening. Now using my left hand, the thumb on the outside, almost like throwing a small bow off the mound, just continue that opening move, pulling the clay out. And on the outside, I'll pick the clay up off a knuckle. I need more power. And I'm not, fingertips are too small and they'll dig into the clay. So by using a knuckle, I can put a lot of pressure in and throw from the inside out to that knuckle and bring the clay up. <coughs> Work the inside again. Keep that curve on the inside fair. You want a nice curve. You don't have to go back and try to find it after you've thrown half the bowl. So throwing up a little bit of moisture, it's a good time to start using a cote. Try a sharp cote. This one has a sharp edge on one side, rounded on the other. Two holes in it just to help me hold it. I'm going to go start in the center and throw to my outside hand, making sure the outside is well lubricated. If you hit a dry spot, it can do disastrous things to your throwing. Now I'm throwing off my fingertips and pressure points are coming together. And up. Okay, a couple more. Just come in there. Finish that inside curve to the way I want it to be. And the rim. Going for a separate rim. It's a nice statement. Kind of makes a frame for the bowl. Keep a nice curve in there. If it gets flat, it's going to flop on you. I'm going to use a small cote just for details. Put in a couple of interesting lines. And the sponge just to smooth it off. Of any rough stuff and the tension to the rim here. You don't want the rim to get thin. You want this rim to be nice, strong, square edged, not too rounded. And you can just refine that curve a little bit, getting to the point where the clay is about to collapse. That's where the good pots always are, just before the pot collapses. Cut off tool, make a mark on the base. Bring it right on through. Bamboo cutoff tool. I just use this to pop the bats off. Free it in a couple of spots. And it's off. That'll be ready to trim in a day or two, depending on the weather. Okay, let's try another one. Anyways, throwing pieces like this off the wheel head is not as difficult as throwing smaller pieces off the mound. You have a great deal of stability in the clay. It's well supported. It's less inclined to do crazy things. At least that's the way I feel about it right now. I like throwing big bowls. And throwing a 13 pound bowl is no different than throwing a 26 pound bowl or a 36 pound bowl. You just need bigger bats takes a little longer to move the clay around. But stability is on your side. Just watch that centrifugal force as the pots get bigger. The centrifugal force on the rim is significant. Remember that everything diminishes on the wheel. Your wheel speed must continually diminish. There's the opening with my left thumb, my right hand on top. Switching off to a five o'clock position. Inside hand opening out. I hold the sponge in this hand and I just squeeze out a little bit of slip as I go. No more than I need, just enough to lubricate under my fingers. You do not need to have this piece awash in slip. In fact, the slip 
is very bad for the clay because too much of it will just weaken the clay. Okay, I'm going in here to knuckle the clay on my first finger of my right hand. Bring that clay in and the inside hand comes across and the bite is coming up. And again, notice the off-center between the fingers as they come up. Critical part. When you release the clay, let it go back to the wheel head. Okay, another pull. When you come to the rim, keep that rim compressed. Every time you hit the rim, there's a statement that needs to be made of compression from both sides and the top. The rim's got to be kept square. Now I'm going to use a, the rounded cote. I could have used either cote in this case, but this one is for, I usually use for bigger pieces. It's got multiple angles on it depending on what's appropriate to the shape you're throwing. Start down the middle, throw it to your outside hand. And I am throwing and shaping on this tool at the same time. And that's pretty well it. Maybe I'll take it out just a tad more. Go back in there with a sharp rib if you wanted to, just to clean up the lines, depending on what kind of a statement you want to make about how this was thrown. Small cote can go in there and just do a detail on the rim. It's kind of nice to have something to break the flow before you hit the rim. And a quick, quick sponging, not enough to drag the grog up. You have to be careful about that. Fairly dry sponge. It's really going in there to compact the clay push the grog back in. Too much sponging is going to pull the grog out. And the cutoff tool, simply make the line around the base, push it on through, break the seal, and another pot is ready for the drying rack. Throwing big pieces like that you can do it all day long. You'll run out of space before you run out of energy to make them. Throwing off the mound is actually trickier. You can throw pots like this all day. They're very stable and they're very inclined to stand, whereas pots thrown off the mound are th have to be thinner all the way down to the foot and therefore a little trickier to throw. Well, that's all there is to it. There are no secrets. Everything I've shown is pretty basic and it's what you need to know to make pots. A uh, word of advice would be don't fall in love with anything you make. Be prepared to throw it all out. The only way you're going to accomplish anything is to go beyond what you know. The moment you think what you've done is good, you'll never go beyond that point. So keep throwing them out. The first ton of clay is the hardest, and after that, things go easily. Thanks a lot.